You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production. It's one of those shocking headlines that can jolt even the most cynical person awake. A family, including children murdered in their home, but for one survivor. The news arriving in the terse, clinical form of a press release, then corrected and corrected again, leaving everyone to wonder about the details beneath the bodies. Six people are dead, four of them children, the youngest just two and a half months old. The crime has shocked the sleepy Ottawa suburb of Barhaven where the crime happened. That was one week ago. Since then, what we've learned about both the family and the suspect has only deepened both the tragedy and the mystery behind it. How could this happen? Why did this happen? How did the accused know his alleged victims? Why the children? So here's what we've learned and what everyone still needs to figure out. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Marlo Glass is a reporter with The Ottawa Citizen who has been covering this tragedy. Hi, Marlo. Hi, Jordan. Why don't you just tell us first uh, what happened on March 6th and what did we learn immediately from police? Certainly. So the very first dispatch that we received from police around that time was just after 11 p.m. on March 6th. And it was just a very quick tweet that said that there is just a police operation going on in Barhaven um, and to avoid the area. And then a few hours later in the in the early hours of March 7th, um, police said that they were on the scene of a homicide on Berrigan Drive and multiple victims had been confirmed deceased with one other person seriously injured. They also said right away that one arrest had been made and that there was no threat to public safety. And I think that that was something that was really top of mind for people because this particular road is buttressed by two schools that are quite nearby. Mm. And so I think that that public safety aspect was really top of mind for people right away. I think immediately following uh, that announcement, there was um, a lot of, as there always is, I guess, a speculation that this was a domestic violence incident. Absolutely, yes. And especially just given what we were told at the very beginning, which is that there were two adults killed as well as four children. The immediate, I guess, assumption was that it was domestic in nature, but police were also quite quick to um, to quell that in, in the morning of March 7th. And I understand um, that there was a lot of confusion about victims, their relation with the accused, who they were, and what had happened in in the hours following. Can you just explain some of that? Well, in the initial moments after the attack, you know, we're all looking for information. And initially, the Ottawa Police Service Chief Eric Stubbs told CBC News that this was a mass shooting. And he later walked that back and then further clarified it in an interview with me later in the morning that it was a, a mass killing and that they weren't releasing the the weapon that was used. The other thing is that, you know, the, the police did release the names of the victims as well as their ages, but it, that was corrected several times in the days following and things like that. I mean, nobody ever wants to get a name wrong or anything like that, but that has been something that that we have been struggling with just to make sure that we have all of the correct information. Let's talk first, um, as we always like to do before we get to uh, the horrific events. Uh, Who were the victims here? Absolutely. Um, The victims are 35-year-old Darshani Dilanthika Ekenayake and her four children, uh, Anuka, who is seven, Ashwini, four, Renea, at three years old, and Kelly, who is just two and a half months old, as well as Gamini Amara Kuhn, um, who was 40 years old and living with the family as well. Tell me a little bit more um, about that family. You know, how did they come to Canada? Who were they? Who were they in the community? Well, the lone survivor, Danushka Wick Remasinghe, uh, he came to Canada a few years ago on his own, and he was a student at uh, Algonquin. They come from Sri Lanka, a city called Kandy, a city of about 130,000 people. 
and he was studying marketing and management at Algonquin College. And he came to Canada alone initially. His family didn't join him until last summer. You know, they're a young family. Their youngest daughter, Kelly, was was born in Ottawa just a, just a few months ago. And their two oldest children uh, went to school nearby. Beyond the initial release that everyone but one member of this family had been killed, uh, what do we know about the attack itself and what was done and how it happened? So what we know is is largely secondhand at this point, just because the remaining survivor is still in hospital. He's still recovering. But we do know from the the local monk that has been visiting him, we kind of have an idea of what happened. So Danushka came home at around 10.30 p.m. on Wednesday night. And it seems from what we know is that he kind of happened upon this unimaginably horrific scene where the accused was waiting for him essentially with, with some sort of weapon. And he attacked the man and Danushka was trying to determine if his family was okay. And, you know, he discovered his family. And then we understand that, of course, he was, um, you know, completely distraught. And some neighbors heard, you know, yelling and a very kind of intense scene. And then police were, were called to the residence shortly after that. How is Danushka doing right now? You know, the mental anguish that this poor man must be going through is, is truly unimaginable. We do know that the Sri Lankan High Commission is attempting to expedite some visas for his family members from Sri Lanka to come to Canada in an attempt to, you know, give him as much support as he possibly needs. So I was told that the family will be here, not weeks, but days. So I, I hope that he can get the, the support that he needs from, from his family and the community. Tell us about the accused. Who was he? What's his relation to the family here? So Fabria de Zoiza is 19 years old and he came to Canada on a student visa to study at Algonquin College. And we believe that that is where he met the survivor, Danushka. The accused's aunt told Global News that the family had shown a lot of kindness to the to the young guy and they had celebrated his 19th birthday recently and that the family had been showing him a lot of kindness and wasn't even charging him rent to live in that Barhaven home. It's a bit of a question mark, but we do know that things had changed with him recently. His last semester enrolled in college was in winter 2023, so he hadn't been attending school recently. And his family members have also told other outlets that his demeanor had changed and he had been blocking his family members and, and not responding to messages. So we do know that that there was something, you know, some trigger perhaps or something that had happened in the in the days leading up to this. But it's a bit of a black box at this point. His social media accounts have largely been scrubbed. A spokesperson for YouTube told me that, um, you know, he had violated the community guidelines. And so as reporters, we do often look to, you know, social media to kind of see what we can glean about people. And so far, we, we still have a lot of questions about this guy. He's living with the family and he's cut off ties with his own uh, family members. And I know you've spoken to, to some of them that are related, but they didn't have any idea of like what kind of motive he could have, A, for the alleged killings, but also just like anything that was going on in his life. That's correct. Yeah, the motive is still a, a big question mark that is lingering at this point, how, you know, someone can turn so drastically on a young family that had been, you know, showing him a lot of kindness and generosity. That is still something that is yet to be known. What's happened that the police are looking at or trying to figure out? Because I, I gather the police have been pretty mum on this, considering like the horrific nature of this crime. Yeah, absolutely. Besides the initial press release and press conference, once the matter goes before the courts, the police will shut it down and they, they won't really give any information. So the court proceedings are, I suppose, when we're going to find out, you know, really exactly what happened and, and what the catalyst was in this regard. Because just based on what we've heard from family members, there was, you know, a significant change in the in the young man leading up to this. What exactly that is, is a mystery at this point. 
How's the neighborhood in general uh, and the community doing? I mean, as you mentioned, this is a, a house right near two schools. This is a, a suburban, you know, uh, quote unquote, the type of place where this doesn't happen. Yeah, absolutely. It does almost sound like a cliche, but I mean, interviewing neighbors and everything directly after the the attack, it was really, you know, one one guy said that it was like something that you see on TV, but you never expect it to, to happen in your neighborhood. It is, you know, a very quiet, peaceful suburb full of families, full of schools, full of, you know, parks. And the nature of the attack, I guess, was just really galling to the community. I mean, as reporters, part of our job is door knocking, right? When something like this happens and to to talk to neighbors. And there was a woman who answered the door and she said that she she couldn't talk to me because she was just, you know, completely distraught. She was in tears. She was holding her own baby in her arms. And many of the neighbors that we did speak to said that, you know, they, they didn't know the family personally. They were quite new to the area, but they were, I mean, completely, completely horrified nonetheless. It's just not something that you really ever expect to happen on your doorstep. Beyond the motive, um, which we might hear in court uh, eventually, I guess, whenever this gets through the system, um, what else don't we know that you'd like to hear from the police, the questions you have that have not been answered? So CTV News reported that police are trying to determine the weapons used in the attack and whether or not there were multiple weapons used in the attack. Initially, the police said that there was an edged weapon that was used, which I think that to the layperson would commonly mean a, a knife or something like that. But um, police, you know, often keep their cards pretty close to their their chest on that one. Um, CTV News also reported that the primary weapon used in the attack was something similar to a hunting knife or something like that. Um, but again, these are still big questions that that we have. Why haven't police been more straightforward with this? I understand the stuff about the motive that has to wait till court, but obviously this is a crime of huge public interest. And usually, you know, I used to be a reporter as well. Usually with something like this, you will at least get some details about what went on inside the house. Yeah, absolutely. This is, I think, something that is kind of part and parcel with being a Canadian reporter, right? Is right. that as soon as something goes before the courts, you are, it's like getting blood from a stone sometimes. Uh, and that's not specific to Ottawa police, but in police forces across the country. And of course, it can be very frustrating and, you know, disconcerting. The, the public obviously has a significant vested interest in, in what went on. And as you say, like this could potentially take years for us to get answers. I was recently speaking with a criminologist who you know, her best bet was that this will probably take two to three years to move through the courts in terms of, you know, determining the mental health and wellness of of the accused mm. and, and things like that. Um, you know, this is going to be a story that is going to stay with us for a very long time. What's the next step in this? Um, I, I realize that, you know, we might not get a, a ton of information at the next court appearance, but what happens now? So... The accused is currently staying in an Ottawa area jail. He's scheduled to be back in court on March 14th. Um, we will then have a better idea of if there will be a bail hearing or the next steps after that. Are we likely to hear any evidence then? I don't believe so. I, I don't think that we'll get to hear any evidence until things move further along. If it does go to trial or if there is an early plea, I think that would be our, our best bet. Also, if the father is feeling well enough to to speak publicly, that will be the other chance for us to to know more about this. And in the meantime, the community is supporting him. And I guess uh, we're waiting for family members to arrive from Sri Lanka. And uh, at some point, there'll be uh, a memorial service and a vigil. Certainly, yes, there will be. There have been significant fundraising efforts spearheaded by the Buddhist Congress of Canada there has been significant outpouring of support. There was a, a vigil last Saturday. I'm also told that the date and time of the funeral will largely be dictated by the police investigation itself, as of course there are six deceased. I have been also been told that Darshani and her four children will be buried here in Ottawa and the family of Gamini Amarakun, they are interested in repatriating his body to Sri Lanka, where uh, I understand he has a young, a young family as well. Marlo, thank you for uh, 
walking us through this. I know it's uh, not really easy at all to cover these kind of stories, uh, never mind retelling it to, to me, especially when there aren't any answers yet. Thank you. Marlo Glass, a reporter for The Ottawa Citizen. That was The Big Story. For more, you can head to thebigstorypodcast.ca. You can always send us feedback about this episode or any other, or suggestions for what we might cover next via email at hello at thebigstorypodcast.ca or by calling us and leaving us a voicemail. The number to do that, of course, 416-935-5935. You can listen to The Big Story on every podcast player. If you do happen to be in a podcast player that lets you rate us or review us or leave a comment or anything like that, it is always appreciated we read and see every one. Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. We'll talk tomorrow. Hello there, it's Peter Mansbridge, host of The Bridge, where we reflect on the issues of the day and how they could impact you. Politics, public health, technology, they are just some of the topics you'll hear about. Cut through the clutter and tune into The Bridge, a Sirius XM podcast available everywhere.